Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself Jonathan at MSPC's Ukraine War Update Extra video, fifth time lucky, uh, giving you extra tidbits and nuggets to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the war in Ukraine. I don't know what video I'm doing on a daily basis, it just stuff comes out of my mouth, I'm like no that was wrong, that was wrong, that was wrong, well that's right, well done. Uh, life is tough, but not nearly as tough as it is for others on the front line, goodness me. Uh, the, the war in Ukraine is now, what, one year and 100 days plus long, and things are as difficult today as they have been. Uh, it, it is incredible. I was uh, speaking to my parents this morning, just uh, doing a bit of an explainer uh, on, on how things are working, what's going on there. You know, and I was explaining to, to them again that, you know, Russia can't win. They're in this, they're in this stuck in this war where they're not sure what their objectives are. Their maximalist objectives are simply impossible. You cannot um, take control. You cannot occupy an entire nation of 44 million people the size that Ukraine is with the forces that you have not even remotely so they can't take Kiev they can't take the whole of Ukraine and again it comes back to what the hell are they doing there like literally what are you doing there Putin and I just it just it amazes me that it's still there but of course sunk cost fallacy now they're in there by kind of mistake because their plan A went wrong and they didn't have a plan B so they kind of tried to invent plan B C and D and they all failed and in the end it's like well let's take the Donbass we can't do that let's take this okay with Sivesk we can't do that area let's take Bakhmut we're just about doing that oh no, we're losing it now. And and so what, what is it that, that would be winning? How can Putin get out of this with, with his head held high? Well, he can't. So the only thing he can do is try to make this a protracted frozen conflict that the West get bored of. And then the West say, well, we're in this for the long haul. And we're going to prove that by sending out a, a long-term support uh, package for so different nations decide to do that. Here's a five-year package we're going to put in place, which is a really strong message to Putin saying, well, you know, your, your way of getting out of this is impossible. You're not going to get out of it. So we're at this position where how does this end? Uh, I can't. You know, who was it you know, that was saying um, it can't end with with Putin being in charge? Is one of the articles I was referring to yesterday. Sorry, so much information. I, I, I've just had a bit mind blank. But you know, the, there is this really, I, I think, quite rational position that actually. This cannot end with Putin still being in charge of Russia. He won't accept anything less uh, than, you know, he won't accept pulling out of Ukraine, which is exactly what Ukraine needs to do. This is what Georgie from Ukraine Matters said the other day. He, he, the, what would be in Russia's best interest is to literally retreat right now. Everything else is going to be a net loss to them. Uh, but Putin won't do that, and so therefore it's in the best interest that, that Putin's not in charge. But how, how do you get to a point where that where that happens? What's the most likely outcome? Is it waiting for him to die of natural causes? Is it some kind of coup, assassination attempt? Is there a public revolution? Or oh, how plausible are those things? How probable are those things? Uh, and it just yeah, you, so frustrating because it's, it's obvious what should happen. Like morally, politically, even from a Russian point of view, George was saying, you know, what should Russia do from Putin's point of view? Pull out. I mean, that's literally in the, in the best interests of, of Russia. Russia should pull out. That's what you would then get your best outcome. Because if you suddenly pulled out, had a change of leadership and said, oh, look, really sorry to the rest of the world, then actually and the rest of the world go, OK, can we make sure this doesn't happen again? Right. Then we put things in place so that we're not sanctioning you till till you you know, you are so critical. As long as we can really wor work out that uh, that you've got a different political mechanism going on, that there's democracy, that's that's you know some kind of functioning democracy is in place, then sanctions get this and that lifted, and that's your best option going forward, or something like that. But the other the other option is to continue going at this war. S still losing in there's just different versions of losing and there is no way that russia can come can, can come out better from this they're not gonna like even if they got to a position where they they are continuing to control crimea and the donbass say you get this frozen conflict and they negotiate where they are controlling crimea controlling donbass you're like yeah but you're still going to be sanctioned to the hilt for, for you still lost all those soldiers and you still had this brain drain and you've still got an economy that is on its knees and it ain't going to get much better so like, uh, yeah it's just anyway but 
uh, yeah, so I'm just amaz amazed we're still in this war and uh, it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Uh, this grinding counteroffensive is going to be a grinding counteroffensive and that 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 looks to be the way it will be until, I, I guess the best hope for Ukraine is until you, you punch through, you find that final weakness or number of weaknesses and punch through and then hopefully it all kind of falls into place. Uh, we, are, we have expectations and myself included that I kind of swing from high to low in thinking about the counteroffensive, and I've got unrealistic expectations that are largely based on my desires, right? And I want this to be a really successful counteroffensive from a Ukrainian point of view. And so when it's slow and grinding, I'm like, ah, no. But of course, it's always going to be that given the defences put in place. I and mean, what was I expecting? Well, this is what I was warning people not to have out, you know, uh, irrational expectations here. And Yet myself, I have a psychology where, you know, my rational mind is fighting with my emotional mind. And uh, I, I kind of, yeah, have this tension going on. But this is what we would expect. And actually, this is still really early doors. You know, this is two weeks in. Don't expect things to be like broken through straight away. Oh, that was great, wasn't it? Magic. We only lost four tanks. Brilliant. And we're through on the way to Melitopol. Excellent job done it's never going to be like that and so it's you know tempering our expectations and, and managing them in a way that that you know accords with reality um anyway that's a lot a lot of preamble there uh where was i going well actually i was going towards uh this idea of saying something that i should have said like for the last four days and jan narkovich in the comments has been harassing me rightly so for not having said this already i talked about senator Dick Black uh, the other day as basically parroting Russian propaganda, absolute Russian propaganda, said Ukraine's offensive hit a steel wall. This is an American politician. 7,000 killed in action, 160 tanks and 360 armoured vehicles destroyed in just one week. So this is like one week ago, right? Uh, with trivial gains. It's a pointless bloodbath. Charred leopard tanks and Bradley vehicles lie everywhere. Telling Ukraine to fight for as long as it takes is inhuman. End this tragic war now. And I just had a go at him say, how can a senator say this? And I was called out correctly because it's not he is a senator, but he's not a state senator. As in, he's not representing the state of Virginia. He is a Virginia state Senate member. So the Senate within uh the state of Virginia, rather than in the house, in in Congress, he's not one of the one hundred uh, senators. Rep the two senators from each state, each fifty state, each of the fifty states represents their state in Congress. That is not what's going on there. So I do apologise. I've corrected that now formally here because uh, I don't like to make incorrect uh, claims. Uh, and he stopped being a Virginia state senate member in uh, twenty twenty. Uh, but it still doesn't you know, uh, contradict the fact that he is living up to his name uh, here with his claims. So, uh, yeah, thanks, Mr. Black. Right, let's go on to other bits and pieces. Uh, mines. I get... I sit on the edge of my seat when I see stuff like this uh, and it gives me a bit of squeaky bun time as you are thinking, oh, I wouldn't want to be doing that. But the reality is that actually that's relatively safe. You can walk on these things, you ain't going to blow up. These things are designed to be blown up by a very heavy tank. So you can end up like kind of throwing these things around and, uh, and it's not too much of an issue. There are so many different types of mines and obviously they have different triggers, different different ways of going off there are mines that could be i was oh, and i forgot to mention this in my uh frontline update around the pietikatki area where they like smoked out the village the ukrainians and apparently according to report from ukraine they're throwing these uh, munitions up from their howitzers from their artillery that then split apart and drop a load of mines and they are being dropped behind places where the russians are then supplying and then they're blowing up on ukrainian lines that are being uh, mines that are being laid uh, because obviously they're not they're thinking well the ukrainians can't lay mines here because this is our territory but of course they can as we know from vukhodar and that is really catching out the russians apparently uh, and though of course they i wonder with those mines where whether they then become an issue for Ukrainians themselves as a firing mines into areas that they're hoping to take over. Does that mean then they, that 
then becomes much slower, even even slower for them to occupy these territories and clear them out because they've laid their own mines as well as the Russian mines. But I guess there's also probably, well, there are different types of mines where they have timed fuses that can, I mean, the more technological mines, you can set the fuses, I think, to, or the triggers to become redundant after a certain amount of time. So that that gives them like a, a time range to be active. Uh, but someone, I'll have to look into this and probably do a segment on mines and different types of mines. You guys in the in the threads, there will be people with far greater expertise than myself being able to let me know, let us know about uh, how how mines are triggered uh, and so on and so forth. Right, Russian trenches are frequently proved better built than their Ukrainian counterparts. Ukrainian soldiers said the March mission report said that the bunkers were akin to Vietnam style spider holes and so deep as to be undetectable by drone. This is what I reported this morning. Let's go into a little bit more detail uh, about this claim. So the New York Times article, Russia learning from costly mistakes shifts battlefield tactics. Moscow's forces remain uneven, but while bracing for a counteroffensive, they have improved discipline, coordination and air support, foreshadowing a changing war. Uh, I'm going to join it a little bit further down. It says Russian armoured columns, for instance, for instance, no longer rush into areas where they can quickly be quickly damaged or destroyed. Troops are more often using drones and probing attacks and sometimes just shouting to find Ukrainian trenches before striking. And the mercenary Wagner group has shown an ability to outpace Ukrainian defenders with a combination of improved tactics and disposable ranks. As it begins its long-awaited counteroffensive, Ukraine is well-armed, backed by improved communication technology and American and European weaponry, but Moscow's forces have improved their defences, artillery coordination and air support, setting up a campaign that could look very different from the war's early days. These improvements, Western officials say, will most likely make Russia a tougher opponent, particularly as it fights defensively, playing to its battlefield strengths. The defensive turn is a far cry from Russia's initial plan for full-scale invasion and Ukrainian defence. Feet. To be sure, along a roughly 600-mile front line, Russia's military abilities remain uneven. Prison inmates have become part of the, uh, their operations, having emerged pro prominently in the battle for Bakhmut, despite their lack of training. The Kremlin's increasing reliance on kamikaze drones or air-dropped glide bombs reflects an ammunition shortage as much as an innovative strategic shift. Quote, they are trying to find rear command posts or companies, brigades, and destroy them at long range to disrupt communication between units as much as possible, said Graf, a Ukrainian drone unit commander. Mostly neutered since the invasion, the Russian Air Force has adapted its tactics and munitions, including glide bombs, to attack Ukrainian forces without risking their aircraft. American officials acknowledge that Russian tactics have improved, uh, but those officials believe, based on battlefield intelligence reports, that the success in Bakhmut was largely because of Wagner's willingness to throw prisoners into the fight, no matter the cost in lies. But the soldiers on the ground saw or something else happening and it talks about you know d different uh, tactics coming out towards the end of uh, the fighting in Bakhmut during the Russian offensive, uh, they started using more sort of trained tr troops to take some of those buildings. Uh, in fact, some of those buildings that the Ukrainians wired to blow up, and they just couldn't cope with the with the onslaught of the Russians. Obviously, as there was a smaller amount of space in Bakhmut to take, the Russians could concentrate their forces much more effectively. Uh, so it, it was always going to be more difficult as it as it as it went on. And so on and so forth. I mean, join it. I mean, there's lots of uh, interesting stuff in this article, but I'm going to join it a little bit later. Around Bakhmut, Ukraine has gained. So this is now forwarding to the Ukrainian sort of start of the counteroffensive around Bakhmut or the counterattack around there. Ukraine has gained territory in recent days to take high ground. Russian forces are hemorrhaging casualties trying to defend a city that sits in a sort of bowl. Russian troops have learned to for to turned to former prison inmates, a tactic first used by Wagner to dig trenches, according to a recently captured Russian soldier who was a former inmate. Russian trenches have frequently proved better built than their Ukrainian counterparts. Ukrainian soldiers said the March mission report said that bunkers were akin to Vietnam-style spider holes and so deep as to be undetectable by drone. Such defensive positions will pose formidable challenges, said one American official, and it is too soon to judge whether Ukraine can overcome them. Russian defences are arrayed in layers and despite months of setbacks and casualties, have shown a resolve to keep fighting. And this is where to keep fighting, I talked about how well it's you kind of necessarily got resolved because if you you know stay where you are, you get blown up by drones throwing IDs at you. If you run backwards, you get shot by barrier troops, and so the only option is to run forward into the enemy. Either you take ground and succeed, 
or you die yourself. And if you succeed, then you're just thrown into it again. So it's this this continues basically until you're dead. But the only option is to really try and surrender in some way. Uh, and it, it's interesting talking about that, talking about these barrier troops. This kind of segues onto my next point here, which is because there's some doubt as to whether these these really do happen. Then we've seen lots of POWs saying, yes, this is a thing. Uh, and there was that video that I showed you the other the other day that showed supposedly Russian barrier troops shooting, retreating Russian troops. There are some claims that that might have been a PSYOPs drone video from the Ukrainian point of view or trying, trying to kind of screw over the psyche of the Russian troops. Um, but even if that was a fake video itself, it is happening. And just to throw something else into the mix to kind of su- kind of support this, it, Shashank Joshi, the uh, the Economist's defense correspondent, said Soviets killed three hundred thousand of their own troops for attempted desertion during the Second World War. Staggering figure, just absolutely insane. So they've got form. Don't think that this is like something that's completely out of the realms of reality. Uh, in Defending Stalingrad, this book says, General Vasily Chuikov shot an estimated 13,500 of his own men as a morale-stiffening exercise, as a historian Michael Burley has noted. By the end of the war, about 300,000 Red Army soldiers had been killed by their own army for attempted flight or desertion. One NKVD tactic was to parachute agents into forward operation zones dressed in German uniforms and then liquidate local partisans who helped them. Just absolutely incredible. Uh, Anyway, uh, let's move on to a bit of a conversation. Actually, I'm not going to talk about this one. It's probably better to talk about this first because this talks more about um, the defensive lines that I was just talking about. So this is Thierry uh, Schmidlin, who is a member of the channel, What a Legend, uh, talking about, again, this is just some guy's opinion. He's not necessarily a military expert, but he does have some pretty decent opinions on the threads. So uh, just something to think about. About the fortified lines. So what's he talking about? These are the fortified lines. This is War Mapper's map talking about the defensive lines in the Zaporizhia and Donetsk oblasts that are set up in varying kind of two varying depths, I guess. So if you look here uh, towards uh, Tokmak and Melitopol, you've got three lines of defense split quite widely. And then you've got other ones going down on certain routes and whatnot. Tokmak is surrounded and coming down from Orokiv, you have, well, actually, it almost looks like there's three lines around about here and then further ones to the south. Brady Af- Afric's um, mapping has been really super useful. Here's uh, another look at that. So around south of Orokiv, you've got sort of three lines there, you can see, then maybe four five six so arguably you know if you come down this route then you have six lines of defense to break through if you're going to take that route so it's about finding the best places to break through could be just from a simple visual point of view this has only got one line there and then a further one here so break through there and then get to Tokmak but of course there might be other reasons why there's only one there there might be natural physical barriers and so on and so forth so it's, it's difficult just from this map to to say, oh yeah, that's the that's the obvious place to attack. But you get the point. The, these things are going to be considerable. They are proving to be significant challenges for the Ukrainians. But Thierry says, please consider that going to those lines will be the main achievement. Just getting there, crushing them, isn't needed at this point. Why? So you don't need to take out the lines. Just be there and engage. Why? One, if the Ukrainians are in contact with those main lines, that will force the Russians to populate them heavily heavily in order to not lose them. In other words, it's about fixing troops, bringing up reserves. And by the way, someone said uh, a comment today, which is a kind of war maxim. The first, the first side to in, you know, to use their reserves is going to be the side that loses. And the the Russians are using their reserves all along this front line. So when we think about, uh, sorry, I know I've interrupted myself here, but when we think about this is a slow and grinding counteroffensive, and you're thinking, 
it's slow because they're coming across these entrenchments, but these entrenchments are being manned or, or the defences are being, you know, populated. The, the, the defensive units here are arguably reserve units. But the, the attackers aren't the reserve attackers, right? These are being specially trained up, ready to go. These are fresh units in the main. Uh, and they're not even the main units. So if these are like the opening vanguard units, but, and they are they are being slowed down because Russia are throwing in their reserves, then actually that is really bloody significant. And the question is, what would Russia have after those reserves? And this is kind of where Thierry's going. So you put both those ideas together, we, it's really important. So he said... Uh, so just to repeat, number one, if the Ukrainians are in contact with those main lines, they'll force the Russians to populate them heavily in order not to lose them. Second, as you said, those lines are very well documented, not like those they face yet, which are more self-made trenches and ditches that can appear in tree lines or somewhere else. So they know where these uh, defence lines are. And I guess if they are going to engage with them, that's because there is a reason to engage with them rather than go where they're not. Uh, once in contact with those heavily fortified lines, the Ukrainians will hassle them without a lot of resources, but a lot of artillery that will hit precisely and force Russians to constantly replenish with troops. In other words, the Ukrainians might hit some of these lines with quite light troop. I mean, goodness me, I wouldn't want to be one of those in, in one of those units. Yeah, your job is to just go up and engage the uh, the Russians so that we can just hammer them with artillery, high Mars, munitions, all sorts. It's like, brilliant. So am I really sacrificing myself? Like, literally, like, you're going to throw me there and uh, and kind of to bait the, the Russians into engagement. Well, yeah. Once in contact with those heavily fortified lines, the Ukrainians will hassle them without a lot of resources, but a lot of artillery will hit precisely and force the Russians to constantly replenish their troops. Those lines are advantageous for the defence, but are also a trap for the reserves. That means that second and third lines then, uh, when they exist, will probably not be populated at all. If someone, if somewhere, but not where they're still engaged, the Ukrainians can break through. They can take the second and third line easily from behind and trap the whole Russian forces. Uh, the breakthrough will then not be needed where uh, there, where it would be the most damageable for the Ukrainians. Uh, building one heavy line was a good idea from Russia. Building two or three will, at least in my opinion, constitute a major failure. They should n only have created heavy strongholds along the grand lines of communications behind, not not lines. In other words, like I think he's basically saying, as you can see down here uh, along kind of this road, the reason why there's a big line of fortifications down there is because that's a grand line of communication. And some of these places, are, you know, where it's going in different directions, they will be placed there because they're protecting grand lines of communication. Um, or, you know, whether that be rivers or whatever. We saw this uh, in certain areas of Kherson as well. There are lots of the roads in Kherson were, that's where the defences were aligned to. Uh, so, yeah, interesting thoughts there from Thierry. Let me know what you guys think. Is, is he onto something? That the more lines that the Russians have built, it means the more you've got to man them, which means the thinner, the more dilution you have with your force concentration. And therefore, it's actually in the end not in your best interest. You just have fewer but more concentrated defences, is what he's saying. But I guess the other option here from uh, my rebuttal to that, or at least a, a point back to that, is it might not be to man all these defences, but what happens is you retreat to them. So it's not like you stay here and then get hammered away. And then once you're completely exhausted in the first line of defense, the Ukrainians break through and come to an empty second line. What happens is you're getting hammered here, you're tritting and tritting. And then at some kind of critical point, you say, right, now we pull back to the second line. And then, you know, you trit the Ukrainians in defending that line. And then at some point, pull back to the third line. I think it's more like that rather than stay at the first line until you're completely exhausted and then there's nothing behind. Uh, anyway, thank you very much. I, I love all my commenters, or most of them. Brilliant stuff. Right, on a completely different, well, somewhat different subject. This is defective uh, commenting about a conversation you had recently. Let me know what you think of this. I had a conversation recently with an old boss of mine where we discussed the rearmament of Europe. 
Three main takeaways from our conversation. First, the EU will not be able to survive as an independent global organisation if Europe does not rearm. The security and defence contributions of certain EU member states have been incredible on a per capita basis, but if not for the massive contributions of the US, Ukraine would not be able would not be in this fight. I broadly agree with that. Russia has unfortunately. I, I always talk about how America is so super important, but actually per capita they're not the number one per capita. The, they're like tenth, I think it is, in the amount of um, equipment and and money and whatnot they have given to Ukraine. There are other nations that have given more stuff per the size of their their population. And you look at the Baltic states, some of the Nordic states, I think um, Poland and whatnot, uh, maybe Czech, Czech uh, Czechia. But they've given much less stuff than the US. The US has given phenomenal amounts because actually their GDP or their per capita, they're just bigger, bigger economies, bigger populations. And so, and they've got massive, massive army US so, uh, and a load of equipment. So they're giving a load more stuff in real terms. Uh, and that they're the biggest contributors as a single entity to the Ukrainians. It just depends how you slice and dice the, uh, the stats. Uh, it's not decrying anyone in that. It's just like you've got to understand you can see these from a different angle. Uh, but he's absolutely right. Without the US, Ukraine would be screwed. Um, Russia has unfortunately pro- proven that by following a post-conflict mindset, the EU is totally reliant on the US for security. But all, uh, all but a small minority of defence experts have been surprised at the expenditure rate of this conflict. And even within NATO, it is only the US who has maintained the ability to fight this sort of war at this sort of scale. Yes, and I, but I guess that's always would have been the, the case. I mean... A lot of Europe is safety in numbers, isn't it? And if you're a load of countries broadly politically aligned post World War Two, then like we don't all have to have like massively strong uh, armies, armed forces ourselves, and we can kind of rely on each other and NATO. Of course, US is driving NATO. Plus, US has far more international ambitions than say Belgium or maybe Italy, right? So Italy is not going around the world sorting out trade deals with everyone like the eu does that now really on behalf of of and i guess it's where he's going on behalf of the european nations but really it's historically been the us maybe a little bit the uk and other big players germany and france maybe a little bit but the us is the one going around the world doing stuff and so with that they they reap the benefits of being this big armed force and yeah not everyone else is paying that much as much money to to build up their defenses but actually, they're also not getting the return on investment for doing that. So the, the US is kind of is, is a nuanced outlook. However, you're know, going forward, there's a realization here from this conflict that actually EU probably needs to beef up their their spending quite a bit in in terms of military. Um, he goes on to say, if Europe does not rearm, an increasingly globally sceptical US will either abandon Europe to defend itself through frustration with the European post-conflict mindset, or it will require greater and greater policy subservience to the US akin to the 1980s. Sadly, ironically, it appears that Warhawks might have been right all along. I mean, yeah, I don't think there, there are, I mean, you look at the isolationism of, say, Trump, there is a move, some in the GOP are looking to put America for the kind of America first idea, which is about isolationism, which is like shrinking. We're not going to spend money on, on the rest of the world. We just look at, look after ourselves. The problem is that does not get you that return on investment of getting involved in the rest of the world and then having huge amounts of trade and, and stuff that really benefits you out there. If you're going to, if you're going to isolate, then yeah, you might not spend as much money and, and, and this or that, but you also not get the, the benefits. So uh, I think abandoning Europe would be a real problem for the US in terms of expecting to maintain themselves at the top of this sort of global hegemony, this global supreme power a network. Um, second, at the same time, it is extremely unlikely that the EU persists in its current form as it, Europe does rearm. It is nigh impossible to fully coordinate coherent and uniform defence and security policies across all EU members. The French have tried for years. I think the EU are thinking long and hard about defence. There's been a lot of talk about an EU, EU defence force, some kind of EU army. People before Brexit in the UK, people were like up in arms about this. Some people, you know, Brexiteers were. I was always like, what's the problem? Like, we, we've got the UN and we've got NATO. Uh, why can't we do that on European wide? I mean, I, I, I just don't have any problem with that at all. Like, as a principle, 
we're already doing it in other ways. Like the whole principle of it is not a problem, but some people find that a really pro big problem. Anyway, I could maybe see that that could be a way that they have to deal with some of these uh, issues. Uh, anyway, um, thus, uh, either the rearmament process will not be well organized, it will be organized by the NATO, the US, a non EU entity, or the EU will need to change in order to make such coordination possible. And it's that last part that I think, yeah, that I think they will have to do that. And, and I think they probably will do that. Whether that were a pursuit of a partially or totally federated Europe or a smaller organisation within the EU focused on defence cooperation or some sort of political forking or weeding out of member states who do not want to adhere to a widely agreed policies, who can say? I think that paragraph is really interesting and I think you will see this will be the catalyst to some kind of European defence integration, I'm fairly sure. And, and I think that makes the most sense because it's, it's funny how... Uh, some people, I saw some really positive reactions to the Nordic states saying we we'll get together and we'll have our air, we'll, we'll integrate our armed forces, particularly the air force. I think so. You have you know Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Finland sort of working together as effectively you could imagine the EU. So why is it okay for them to do that, but not being the EU? The, EU, the words the EU, the acronym, just bring, brings some people out in like a cold sweat. The EU can't do this, but oh, the Nordic states can do that together. Well, like, why? Why can they have this like integrated armed forces that we all go? Yeah, that's a really good idea. It's going to be cheaper. You're going to be more effective. You can specialize in different areas. You guys have got expertise that you can provide. That we'll provide the airframes. You do this. Like everyone works together. Job done. M much more effective. Uh, much better for everyone. That just makes sense. So um, you know better together and all that kind of stuff. So I think if we can accept that that's that's a good thing for the Nordic states to do, then you know, that can be a benefit for the EU to do as well. And I'm not trying to be pro or anti-EU. I'm just like a group of countries getting together to do a thing together is likely to have benefits. You know, that's that's the nature behind a trade block. That's literally the advantages you have of a, of a trade block. So um, uh, there you go. Uh, third, in the coming changes and rearmament, there exists opportunities for some European states to rewrite their place in the European community, both positively and negatively. Poland is absolutely the best example of this, but Sweden also has the opportunity to elevate their place through the licensing and sales of their defence technology, which were designed to fill a specific niche, which I think uh, more nations are now taking seriously. On the other side of the fence, German leadership within the EU has been once again cast into doubt, as many Eastern Europeans view Germany's actions thus far as showing what the Germans are willing to sell them out to the Russians for cheap raw materials. Going back to Poland, though, there's some claiming within EU that Poland are being really strong on this one thing, on Ukraine, but outside of that, actually, they're not that powerful still. So it, you can get somewhat blinded by the light of their activity with regard to, to the war and think that's extrapolated, uh, that can be extrapolated to all their other Polish activities within the EU, but apparently they're still not really that strong in any in any other context uh is 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 the uh the kind of refutation maybe partially of that point um but certainly you going forward there is a there is a shift of power possibly away slightly away from the german uh germany france possibly italy a tiny bit and italy are politically a bit different now than they were and obviously the uk are out um on the, uh, the Germans are moving now, but as the wealthiest European nation, they are not doing enough to maintain the old EU position. They are not capable of devoting the massive amounts of material that the US non-EU entity brings, and they have thus far been unwilling to devote a per, the per capita assets that less wealthy EU members have brought. As an American German himself, this, this uh, commenter, I feel well qualified to speak about the German cynicism towards lesser, uh, scare quotes, lesser EU members. The Germans consider themselves the bankrollers of the EU, and especially under Merkel, the thought process was what is good for Germany is good for Europe. That is being undone before your eyes, resulting in a growing soft power vacuum in Europe, and soft power vacuums so often tend to turn into hard power struggles. Europe 20 years from now, 20 years from now, will be very, a very different uh, Europe. One honorable honorable mention point as time goes on, the EU if the EU is unable to grow and adapt as needed, our collective assessment of Brexit might be radically altered. It depends what your assessment of that is. Uh, it's a bit like evolution, right? It's adapt or die. So e the EU will adapt in order to survive. And and I think it will have to. And it, the EU will be whatever most of the people within it need it to be. 
Uh, but it, it'd just be interesting as, as to what goes on in each country's internal pol politics to then be reflected it with their MEPs and members for European Parliament to see that then reflected coming back. So there's this kind of interaction between the countries uh, and and the the kind of federation of Europe, Europe if you like. Uh, yeah, and there has been a, a shift towards the right in many European nations, including places like S Sweden, Sweden, Italy, Hungary, um, Poland, uh, even France. You know, France is teetering. Marine Le Pen, uh, the what used to be the Front National, uh, I forget what they're called now, uh, have been growing in in popularity consistently for for many years. Uh, same in the UK uh, to some degree. Uh, and hence Brexit. So there is a changing political landscape in Europe. It depends whether there'll be a like a shift back. It's going you know, sometimes you go from one one side to the other in these big swings. Uh, the pendulum, uh, political pendulum. Uh, but I, I don't know. The EU will be a reflection of those inside it. So uh, and yeah, uh, I guess next 20 years will be super super interesting to see how that pans out right just a few really quick things uh photo is said to said to be from the village of rosdolne in the occupied part of Kherson region so these are fish uh, i can't verify this but as tim white says this that he can't find this image anywhere else so it does seem like it's new out uh just again the environmental uh catastrophe that was the dam uh and here again similar subject so this is uh the uh, well, there's a couple of interesting points to note about this. This is on the beach, I think, in the occupied Kherson region or certainly on the Black Sea coast. So first of all, people are still holidaying around there. And, and even though the, this is occupied uh, territories, there are still people going to the beach, which I find interesting, like it's a war going on. And I guess people still, you just still carry on living as much as you can, uh, as normally as you can, uh, irrespective of where, whether you are pro-Ukrainian or pro-Russian, you're like, yeah, it, uh, we still need to live and it's a hot day, let's go down the beach type thing. Uh, uh, but I wouldn't go in that water, the amount of pollution that's around, and here you can see wild boars. So apparently wild boars are washing up on the uh, on the beaches there, the Black Sea, as a result of the uh, the flooding from the Kokofka Dam. Uh, talking about water, we have... Uh, the Russians apparently running out of water. We need 400 pieces of five litre bottles in the 3rd Battalion of the 291st Regiment. Contact for communication. The problem with drinking water is confirmed here. Uh, so th this is this is a thing. The, the Russians are having trouble with water and that's near the front line. So they their troops need water. And that's the sort of thing that I think the Ukrainians will have an advantage logistically. It's their own country, all these sorts of things. I think they'll just have a natural advantage with being able to uh, get stuff like water and food to their front line. You've got, you got charities like Frontline Kitchen working um, to, to feed the frontline troops. I don't think the Russians have that kind of equivalence and that translates into them struggling going forward and that will affect their morale, uh, so on and so forth. And then the next thing I probably don't have time to do, so I'll leave that to uh, tomorrow. So I'm just going to have a little segment tomorrow on thermal imaging uh, and whatnot, uh, but you can wait for that uh, till tomorrow. In the meantime, thank you so much for your support. Really appreciate all of your support. It's absolutely incredible. Thanks to those on Buy Me A Coffee. Uh, really appreciate that. I'll read out some of your names tomorrow. Uh, and thank you to all the members who are superb and all the people who, who support this work. I really appreciate it. You're a wonderful community. Uh, take care, and I will speak to you tomorrow.